Shalom Hadavarnix. Welcome to our next session in the book of Isaiah. We're in session number 21. We're working our way through the book of Isaiah using Ariel's exegetical outline notes produced by Dr. Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum. This is our base for our class. Okay, let's take a few minutes to review where we were last session. Last session, we started out in the tribulation in verses 1 through 20 of chapter 24. Move quickly to the second coming, a quick glimpse at the second coming, and then into the kingdom in chapter 4, verse 23 through 27, 13. We learned that there are five manifestations of the Shekinah glory in the kingdom. The first one is in the Holy of Holies of the Millennial Temple in Ezekiel 43. Secondly, the Shekinah glory will appear over Millennial Mount Zion. We looked at that in Isaiah chapter 4, way back when in, in chapter 4. Third, we saw that the, the uh, Shekinah glory would uh, be around Jerusalem as a wall of fire. That's Zechariah chapter 2. Uh, it will be with Israel. It'll appear with Israel. We'll get more details on that as we uh, get to Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 60. And finally, the Messianic person will glow with the wonder of the Shekinah glory. Uh, the Shekinah glory will appear in the person of Messiah Yeshua, Zechariah 2.5. And again, here's that illustration I love to show of the Shekinah glory around and over Mount Zion, protecting and uh, glorifying the city. We also reviewed the Jewish wedding system and saw how it uh, coordinated with the church. The first step of the Jewish wedding system was the arrangement divided into three parts. Uh, the first part was the agreement where the father of the bride and the father of the groom reach an agreement regarding the marriage of their children. And God the Father and God the Son came to an agreement regarding the future of the, of the Messiah's bride, the salvation of the world in Ephesians 1.4. Then the bride price was paid, and where the father of the groom pays the, uh, makes, pays the bride, bride price for the uh, wedding, and the bride price that uh, the God the Father paid was the death of his son, the death of Messiah for our salvation. Uh, the third step is the giving of a token. This token is given for a guarantee, a guarantee that the arrangement would come to pass. And that's what the Holy Spirit is, we learn in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. He is our guarantee that this agreement, this arrangement, will come to pass. Then we move to the preparation. Uh, the preparation is the betrothal period. It lasts for approximately one year. That's kind of a normal time for the betrothal period. And during the betrothal, the bride prepares herself to become a suitable bride for the groom. And that's a picture of the sanctification process in 2 Corinthians 11.2. At the same time that the bride is preparing, the groom is preparing a suitable home for his bride. And that's what Yeshua is doing for us in John 14. He's gone away to prepare a place for us. Then comes the fetching of the bride. The bride is taken to the groom's home, and that is paralleled by the rapture of 1 Thessalonians 4. Then the ceremony, the ceremony takes place at the groom's home under the chuppah, and we read about the wedding of the lamb in Revelation 19, verses 6 through 8. That's the ceremony. And then the marriage feast follows. The marriage feast begins the marriage, and so the marriage feast begins the kingdom, or a feast begins the kingdom, we learned in Isaiah 25, verse 6. I also took a few minutes to do a little bit of a drosh on, on Isaiah 23 through 25. The theme I chose was praise, and Israel was singing a song of praise for deliverance, blessings, and judgment on her enemies. And we as believers can also praise God for deliverance from our sins, for the fact that we've received all spiritual blessings, and the fact that our, our number one enemy, Satan, has been defeated. We also looked at a few more uh, features of the Messianic Kingdom, feature number 28, we saw that there are five manifestations of the Shekinah glory in the kingdom. Number 29, we uh, were, were familiarized with the wedding supper of the Lamb. Number 30, we saw that there would be a removal of sorrow and shame and death and reproach in the kingdom. And number 31, that judgment will be enacted upon the enemies of God. All good features. We also learned that the mountains in Scripture can be a symbol of God's eternality. He is our rock. And here's a picture of Mount Hermon that I took at the base of Mount Hermon. Looming above me is this huge uh, rock that cannot be moved. And here's another picture. Again, I took of Mount Hermon up on the Golan Heights. Uh, again, the Lord is our rock. 
And it doesn't have to be a huge mountain like Mount Hermon, Mount Tabor will communicate the same truth to us. The Lord is our rock. He doesn't move. We can always count on him being there, just as Mount Tabor has been there for thousands and thousands of years. We then exp explain the purposes for the tribulation. There are three main purposes for the tribulation. Number one, to make an end of wickedness and wicked ones. Number two, to bring about a worldwide revival. And number three, to break the power of the holy people. And if you'd like more detail on this uh, subject of the tribulation, I, recognize, I recommend the book Footsteps of the Messiah by Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum of Ariel Ministries. This is a commentary on the book of Revelation from a Jewish perspective and from a chronological perspective, the study of prophetic, a study of the sequence of prophetic events. Very good book. Highly recommend it. All right, that brings us to uh, our new material. We're in chapter 26 of the book of Isaiah. Uh, we're in a section of praise for the deliverance of Israel. We saw in verse 11, God had a great zeal for Israel, and the result will be peace for Israel in the Messianic kingdom in verse 12. And then in verse 13, Israel thinks back over her history, over the fact that she has had previous lords. Verse 13, O Lord our God, other masters besides you have ruled us, but through you alone we confess your name. So that's a quick summary, just a one verse summary of the Gentile dominations Israel has experienced throughout history, primarily the times of the Gentiles that we're experiencing right now. Remember the times of the Gentiles are defined by Luke 21, 24. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so the times of the Gentiles spans the time frame from the Babylonian destruction in 586 BC until the second coming of the Messiah. So we are in the times of the Gentiles right now. And remember, this does not, this does not uh, exclude temporary Jewish control over Jerusalem, like with, during the Maccabean period for 100 years or so, and uh, like we're experiencing now in 2018. But our, our uh, control of Jerusalem will end in the tribulation period when the Antichrist attacks. So there will be one more diaspora for the Jewish people. The times of the Gentiles will not be over until Yeshua returns. All right. Now they said that it is only the God, only God that they will worship. Only God will be the Lord of Israel. And Israel's past failures caused her to be dominated by other lords, but no more. You know, this is the curses of the covenant. Here is a map of the four empires of Daniel 2 that dominate us during the times of the Gentiles. There's the Middle East, the Babylonian Empire dominated us, 585 to 539 BC. And then on a larger scale, the Persian Empire dominated the area, 539 to 330 BC. Uh, the Hellenistic Empire came out of Greece and dominated the area from 333 to 164 BC. And finally, the Roman, Roman imperialism took over Jerusalem in 63 BC until the present. And Roman imperialism is the final kingdom, the kingdom that will go worldwide. And so it is still extending its tentacles around the world through uh, hegemony or um, influence, not through territorial expansion anymore, but through economic and political influence. So Rome does continue to expand to, to control the world. And uh, Israel's plight is that she, yes, is very dependent on Rome these days very dependent on this final empire. And uh, her friendship with the United States, her dependence on the United States is a, is a clear example of that. If we turned our backs on Israel, and we will in the future, Israel will be in deep trouble. All right, so her past failures, Israel's past failures, have caused her to be dominated by other lords, but never more. Verse 14, the dead will not live, the departed spirits will not rise, Therefore you have punished and destroyed them, and you have wiped, all, wiped out all remembrance of them. So these past lords are all dead now. They will not live again. They will not dominate Israel again when the kingdom is instituted. Now they will be resurrected. They will be resurrected, but only for the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it and from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great, there's the kings, 
the kings and dictators who have uh, dominated Israel. Then I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things were written in the books according to their deeds. So everybody's on level ground at the great white throne judgment, all the unbelievers. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Verse 14, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So that's the fate for Israel's enemies, those who have dominated Israel. They are now they are now departed spirits. They're shades that will not rise again. We, um, we took a look at those shades when we were in Isaiah chapter 14. Remember 14 verse 9, the Antichrist is killed at the second coming and he is sent to Sheol. And we read in Isaiah 14, 9, Sheol from beneath is excited over you, excited over the Antichrist, to meet you when you come. It arouses for you the spirits of the dead, all the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. They are just, oppre uh, they are just shades now, all these former oppressors. They have now died. They have a shade-like existence. They are destroyed. There is no remembrance of them. But in contrast, in verse 15, Israel is going to grow. Israel is going to experience new growth. You've increased the nation, O Lord. You have increased the nation. You are glorified. You've extended all the borders of the land. So when, when Messiah, when Yeshua reigns over the world and over Israel, Israel will be increased two ways. First of all, the population will be increased. And there's a need for that because during the tribulation, Israel's worldwide population, the worldwide population of the Jewish people, I should say, uh, will be attacked and will be reduced by two-thirds. Two-thirds of the worldwide Jewish population will be killed during the Tribulation Holocaust, Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. It will come about in all the land, a better translation is world, it will come about in all the world, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. See, two-thirds of the worldwide Jewish community killed, perish. And I will bring the third part through the fine, through the fire, this is the faithful remnant, and refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested, and they will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is my God. Okay, so God will be glorified by the population increase of the Jewish people. And we'll look in verse, when we get to verse 9, we'll see one of the means, one of the means that he will use to increase the population of the land. So the population of Israel will be increased and the borders of the land, secondly, will be extended to cover all the promised land. And so the first time in history, Israel will possess all of the promised land. Now here's the boundaries of the land. Here's the boundaries of modern Israel today. And this is what I believe is the boundaries of millennial Israel. That the boundaries will be expanded, extended to this uh, the, the, to this size to accommodate all the Jewish people. So that will be the boundaries of the land in the Messianic Kingdom. And again, for the first time in history, Israel will possess all of the promised land that we've been promised. So now I want to take an extended aside. I want to answer the question, first of all, how did I determine the boundaries of the promised land? What in the world are they? There's a lot of controversy over this. So I'm going to give a shot at it. I'm going to take this little aside, well it's going to be an extended aside, and we're going to look at what I believe is the boundaries of the Promised Land and how I derive these boundaries. All right, here's modern Israel as we see it today approximately. And this is the boundaries of the land accepted by most commentators using Ezekiel 47, 15 through 20, and Numbers 34, 1 through 12 as the boundaries of the land. A little bit bigger than modern Israel, but definitely not as big as I I uh, figure, feel the land should be. Now Ezekiel 47, 15 through 20 and Numbers 34, 12 may be the initial borders of the kingdom. I don't have a problem looking at those verses and, and seeing this as the borders because this may be the initial borders of the kingdom. But as the Jewish population increases, the final boundaries should be uh, derived from a more extensive use of cross-references. Again, as the, as the um, 
population of Israel increases, the land is going to have to be extended. And so I think if you look at a more extensive use of cross-references, you'll see that the land will extend out to this area, out to the borders that I project. We have to remember the principle of expansion for obedience and contraction for disobedience. If we disobey the Lord, uh, the land will be, the land, the borders of the land will be contracted. And if we obey the Lord, the boundaries of the land will be expanded. And of course, in the kingdom, all Jewish people will be believers. We will be obedient to the Lord. We'll be blessed by the Lord. And so the land will be expanded to the full promise given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's take a look at this principle of expansion for obedience, because the Jewish people will be obedient in the kingdom. We start with Exodus 24, 34. God says, For I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders. That's very clear, isn't it? And no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. Oh, well, that's Exodus 24, 34. Deuteronomy 19, 8. If the Lord your God enlarges your territory, just as, as he has sworn to your fathers, see enlargement of the territory for obedience, and gives you all the land which he had promised to give your fathers. So at, in, at the time of the writing of Deuteronomy 19.8, Israel did not possess all the land at all. <laughs> so he, God promises he will expand the land until we receive all that he promised to give to the patriarchs. Deuteronomy 33.20, of Gad he said, blessed is the one who what? Enlarges Gad, and that term enlarges means territorial enlargement. So Gad's territory will be increased. Another example of um, increase for obedience. Deuteronomy 12.20, when the Lord your God extends your border as he has promised you. Another time is referred to. And now in Genesis 15.18, the, the borders extend from the river of Egypt and that's the Wadi Al-Arish, approximately this area right here, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, so from the Wadi Al-Arish to the river Euphrates, and that uh, twisty area on the north is the Euphrates River going along its, uh, its riverbed. So the borders run from the Wadi Al-Arish in the south to the river Euphrates in the north, and of course we always have to keep that river Euphrates in mind, the northern border in mind, when we look at these uh, sections of scripture dealing with the border. So Genesis 15, 18 is also repeated in Exodus 23, 31. Now we continue on in Genesis 15 with verse 19 and we look at the inhabitants of the land and we find out where are these people living? Are they living within the borders of the land as promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And I can tell you, yes, they are. First of all, the Kenites, they lived in the south. The Kezanites, we don't quite know where they live, but they did live in the south as well. The Kadmonites, the Kadmonites, the word just means the Easterners. So again, we can't place them very clearly. And the Hittite, the Hittites lived in Turkey, but their territory extended down into the Levant. So we have to include uh, the northern border there. We have to include Hittite territory in our understanding of the land. And the Perizzite, uh, the Perizzite, the word just means villagers, so we can't place them very precisely. The Rephaim, the Rephaim lived in, this, lived in this area. And the Amorite, they lived in the south. And the Canaanite, well, that's just a generic term for all the tribes, so I just stuck them in generically there. And the Girgashite, and we don't know exactly where the Girgashites were living. And the Jebusite, and so we know the Jebusites were living in Jerusalem. So this is a start. This is a start. We see that... At this point, the, the peoples we can pinpoint all live within the borders of the land promised to the patriarchs. Joshua 1.4 says the boundaries will be from the wilderness, and the wilderness is just the Arabian Peninsula here, where it turns into desert, and the boundary is uh, the uh, fertile crescent, where the, where the rainfall comes is, the, is um, the, the boundary of the land, and it's kind of vague, I understand that and the wilderness is where the rainfall is virtually non-existent. So the wilderness is to the east on the Arabian Peninsula, the nor northern part of the Arabian Peninsula, and this Lebanon, Lebanon is the Lebanon Mountains here, so from the edge of the desert to the Lebanon Mountains, even as far as the Great River, the River Euphrates, there's the Euphrates River, so all this territory is included in the land given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the land of the Hittites, so there's that northern border again, 
I, I uh, extend the border up to what I consider is a logical place to include the land of the Hittites coming down. As far as the Great Sea, that's the Mediterranean, toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. So all this territory, this northern section of the land is all included in Joshua 1.4. Deuteronomy 7. Turn and set your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites. So they lived uh, in the area around Jerusalem in the Judean hills. And all their neighbors in the Arabah, just south of them was the Arabah, with people living in, that, uh, in the um, uh, Dead Sea Valley there. In the hill country, the hill country would be the uh, hills of Judea. And in the lowland, the lowland is the Shvela along the coast. And in the Negev, the Negev Desert is right there. And by the sea coast, that would be the Philistine Plain uh, along the coast. The land of the Canaanites, again, I put them in generically, and Lebanon. So here again, all the areas of the land fall within the borders promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and are mentioned as, the, as territory belonging to the Jewish people. As far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and again, we remember, we see that the Euphrates River is emphasized. That northern border is very clearly uh, designated over and over again. Micah 7.14 reads, Let them feed on Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old, and that's kind of in the east of uh, Israel as we know it today. So Bashan and Gilead are, this areas, are these areas. Ob Obadiah 19, uh, When the kingdom comes, those in the Negev, the Negev, of course, is to the south, the desert of the south, will possess the mountains of Esau, and this is the Mount Seir mountain range. So that mountain will be possessed by the Jewish people. And those in the Shvela, that's the uh, lowlands, will uh, possess the Philistine plain, and that's the sea coast. So again, all these areas are mentioned. Also possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and that's the northern part of the Judean hills. So again, all this territory is falling within the borders that I have uh, designated here for you. And Benjamin will possess Gilead, Gilead, living, uh, Gilead being this area right here. Psalm 72, 8, speaking of the Messianic reign, may he, speaking of Messiah, may he also rule from sea to sea. And we have two seas. We've got the Great, the great Sea, the Mediterranean, and the Red Sea. That's the southern border, from sea to sea, and from the river, uh, from, the, from the Wadi al Arish there, from sea to sea, to the Euphrates River, and to the ends of the earth. So Messiah will not only rule over Israel, but he will rule over the entire planet as well. And this is repeated in Zechariah 9.10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations. And his dominion will be from sea to sea, there's that southern border along the Wadi Al Arish, and from the river all the way north, the Euphrates River, uh, to the ends of the earth. And not limited to Israel, but to cover the entire planet. Again, now why do we need this expansion? Why does this territory need to expand? Well, Isaiah 49.20 is a cute way of uh, describing it. The children, whom you were be, uh, uh, the children of whom you were bereaved will yet say to your ears, this place is too cramped for me. Make room for me that I may live here. So there, not only will Jerusalem be cramped with Jewish people, the land will be cramped and will plead for the Lord. Give us more room. Give us more room. And so he will give us all the room we need. Ezekiel 36, 37. Thus says the Lord God, this also will I let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. I will increase their men like a flock. See, in the previous, in the previous verse, Israel was asking, you know, give us more room. We're cramped. We're cramped. Ezekiel 36, 37 uh, re reaffirms that. I will, I will let the house of Israel ask me to do this for them, and I will increase their men like a flock. So the population is going to be increased. Ezekiel 37, 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them, and there it is, multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. So Israel is going to be multiplied. We're going to need the territory. And this need for expansion is summarized very, very uh, amazingly in Hosea 1.10. God says, Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. There's going to be a lot of us, a lot of us in the kingdom. And in the place where it was said, 
to them, you are not my people. It will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. So there'll be a great need for this expansion. And so that is the boundaries of the land. That's why I pick these larger boundaries as the boundaries of the land. Now in Ezekiel 48, we also get a glimpse at the tribal allotments in the kingdom. Now here I've uh, put the boundaries of the land and superimpose them over a Google Earth map, just so you get a, get a perspective uh, on a real picture of the planet. And uh, from north to south, the tribes will be given allotments of land, strips going east and west, starting north. Uh, there'll be Dan, then moving south, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, Judah, then comes Millennial Mount Zion, Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, and Gad. The bigger tribes getting a bigger inheritance, the smaller tribes getting a smaller uh, uh, tract of land. Another feature of the Messianic Kingdom and the land will be Millennial Mount Zion. Now Millennial Mount Zion will be the tallest mountain on planet Earth and the top of the mountain will be a 50 square mile plateau. And so I've done a close to scale plateau and plopped it down on the current topography of Israel and uh, just to show you how it'll look. So we'll explain this map in a little more detail. Now when we say it's going to be the highest mountain uh, on planet Earth, we're not talking about Mount Everest here. It's not going to uh, Mount Zion, uh, Millennial Mount Zion does not have to be higher than 29,029 feet. It doesn't have to be that high. You'd need oxygen to go there, wouldn't you? We're not talking about a mountain that high. Uh, in the biblical view of things, a smaller mound cl uh, qualifies as a mountain. For example, Mount Tabor. It's only 1,200 feet high, but it qualifies as a mountain. So the Millennial Mount Zion doesn't have to be as tall as Mount Everest, it can be quite a bit lower, but it will be the highest mountain on planet Earth because of the great geological, geogra uh, geographic, and um, uh, changes in the surface of the Earth due to the tribulation judgments. Great geological shifts in the tectonic plates will bring all the mountains down and uh, lift Mount Zion up to be the highest one. How high that will be, we have no idea. Well, let's take a look at the at Millennial Mount Zion and that plateau. That plateau is 50 miles by 50 miles, and it's divided up from north to south from a section by a section 20 miles deep, 20 miles deep, and 10 miles deep. Then from east to west, the southern section is divided into a section 20 miles by 10 miles by 20 miles. 20 miles, 10 miles, 20 miles. So that's the basic division of Millennial Mount Zion. Now, in the middle of the northernmost segment sits the temple. It'll be quite large. It'll be one square mile in size, quite a bit bigger than, we, than the temple complex we see today. And so it'll be, sit in the northern end of Millennial Mount Zion, and the surrounding area will be the living area for the priests, the sons of Zadok. The central area will be for the, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, and they will live in this area. And the southern section will house the 10 mile by 10 mile city of Jerusalem, and there'll be food growing areas on either side to the east and to the west. Now, a unique feature of Millennial Mount Zion is the Millennial River. The Millennial River will flow out of the temple, it'll flow east, and then it'll eventually turn south and flow down to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, it'll break into two streams, two major streams, maybe more, but two major streams, one going down to the Mediterranean Sea and the other major th stream running down over to the Dead Sea. And so that's why I have all those features on this map of Millennial Mount Zion. So we see that there's going to have to be some topographical changes to the land for all this to work. The Jordan, uh, Jordan River Valley, for example, has got to be raised up and flattened out. And the Dead Sea, while recognizable, may have its northern end modified quite a bit. The seacoast has to be modified. It has to bulge outward a bit to take care of the foundation for the, for the mountain. Anyway, things will change, but that's what the Book of Revelation says. The Book of Revelation tells us there'll be gigantic geographical, geological, and topo topographical changes to planet Earth because of the Revelation, uh, revelation judgments, the, the tribulational judgments. So even though it doesn't look like it'll, it'll work now, 
God's going to change the topography of the land so it will work. So just trust him. What will Millennial Mount Zion look like? Could it look like this? Could it just be a huge upthrust of rock? A 50 mile by 50 mile upthrust of rock? Now, I don't know how big this is, but it's happened before. This is Monument Valley in the U.S. And here's another butte in Monument Valley, a big vertical upthrust of rock. You see those little black dots down at the base? Those are houses. So this is a huge upthrust. And Millennial Mount Zion could possibly look like that. Now, we have never possessed all of the promised land. I have said that a number of times. And the closest that Israel has come to possessing all the promised land was Solomon's kingdom. You see the orange and purple area to the south is the area of Saul and David. And then Solomon extended the area, the economic control, to that yellow area in the north. But there really weren't Jewish people living up there. It was just economic control. So that's kind of a poor, I wouldn't call that occupation of the land, possessing the land. And of course you can see that Phoenicia on the west and Hamath to the north, Hamath, were uh, not under Jewish control at all. And so all this will become eventually Jewish territory. And so we've only possessed maybe 50% of the land promised to the, to the patriarchs at this point in time. We possess even less uh, today. We possess maybe 30% of the promised land uh, in modern Israel today. So there's quite a bit of expansion ahead of us. So these are the boundaries of the land as I understand them in the millennial kingdom. Land will be extended and God will be glorified as he increases the Jewish people. Now there are other proposals floating around out there for the boundaries of the land. So I thought I would familiarize you with these other proposals because you're probably going to run into them. And here I'll let you know why I don't think they work. They're a little bit extreme. Here is the Middle East. One proposal makes the river of Egypt the eastern arm of the Nile, right there. Another proposal makes the river of Egypt the uh, swampy area approximately where the um, Suez Canal is located today, the eastern edge of Egypt. So that's the two borders that some people um, think will be the borders of the the western borders of the land of Israel. However, if the eastern arm of the Nile or the eastern edge of Egypt is the location of the river of Egypt, then all or part of the Sinai Peninsula is included in the promised land. You see that red line going down including the Sinai Peninsula. All or part of it is included in the promised land. That would mean that the Jewish people entered the promised land immediately upon leaving Egypt during the Exodus. That did not happen. We did not enter the promised land as soon as we stepped out of Egypt. So I don't think these borders are very valid. I don't accept that position at all. All right, other people ex uh, ex accept the, the southern border as being the Wadi al-Arish, and so they uh, put the line there, put the southern border there, and I think that's a good place to do it. But then they extend the southern border across the Arabian Peninsula, from the, some from the southern part of the Wadi al-Arish all the way across the Euphrates River and some from the northern part of the Wadi al-Arish across to the, Bab to the Euphrates River in Babylon. Then they run the border up the Euphrates River. So they're including the Euphrates River, which is fine. And then they say this is Greater Israel, that whole territory. Well, there's problems with this issue as well. If the southern border extends across the Arabian Peninsula in either, uh, either of these two locations, doesn't matter which one, then the Jewish people entered the Promised Land when we started northward up the King's Highway through Edom and Moab. And when we started northward right through there, we entered the Promised Land. And that did not happen. That did not happen. So these borders just don't work. They don't work. So here's the borders I propose. And so they work well. They also work with the uh, first attempt to enter the Promised Land. That was at from Kadesh Barnea, just to the south of the Wadi al-Arish. And that attempt to enter the Promised Land was rebuffed because our, uh, our disobedience and lack of faith, the incident with the 12 tribes. So we didn't enter the land there. We were still outside the land at that location. So then we wandered for 40 years in the wilderness as punishment and we entered the land 40 years later here north of the Dead Sea. And that fits my map as well. It doesn't fit the other proposals that I've looked at. 
So that's why I think that the boundaries I propose for you are the most logical and best solution to the problem. All right, that's our little aside on the boundaries of the land. Uh, I hope that helps you to defend Israel and our ownership of the promised land these days and our future in the kingdom. All right, so Israel has been thinking about, uh, uh, remembering that due to our sins, many, many lords have ruled over us, but they are no more. But Israel's travail is then um, brought out, is then referred to. This is uh, verses 16 through 18, refer to her suffering during the tribulation. And Israel's repent repentance comes during that time, verse 16. O oh Lord, they sought you in distress, that's the Jewish people. They could only whisper a prayer. Your chastening was upon them. Now this is Israel in the kingdom, remembering back to the tribulation period and the chastening that was upon us. And uh, it's Israel's prayer at the end of the tribulation that brings the second coming of the Messiah. And that's the point of Isaiah 20, of Matthew 23, 39. Yeshua said, for I say to you, you will, from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the great messianic greeting of Psalm 118. So in other words, we have to call on Yeshua to return and welcome him back. So at the end of the tribulation is the second coming of Yeshua. So in our distress, we will look for God and we will pour out a prayer while being chastened. And the words of that prayer are found in three different areas, Isaiah 64, Psalm 79, and Psalm 80. We'll just look at one small portion of Psalm 80. Psalm 80, verse 17. Israel is in distress, about to be destroyed. Israel cries out to God, and Israel says, let your hand be upon who? The man of your right hand, upon the son of man, whom you made strong for yourself. So who are they calling for? Well, who's the son of man? Well, Yeshua took that title as his title. He's the son of man, the son of man, the one who looked like a son of man, who resembled a son of man in the book of Daniel. And he said, I am the son of man, I am the Messiah. Now, where's the Messiah today? He's sitting at the right hand of God. And so during the Messian, excuse me, during the tribulation, Israel will look to the man sitting at the right hand of God, the Messiah, the son of man, and beg for him to return. Also Isaiah 64, 1, and 1 through 12, and Psalm 79, 1 through 13. So that's the point. Israel poured her, her heart out in prayer while being chastened. And so the troublous times, the period of chasing, are the tribulation. They are also called the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel will also confess that we failed to produce before the tribulation period. In, our, in the time we had on, pla on planet Earth, we didn't do God's will, verses 17 and 18. As the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, we, she writhes and cries out in her pain. Thus we were before you, O Lord. We were pregnant. We writhed in labor. We gave birth, as it seems, only to wind. We could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor were inhabitants of the world born. So previous to the tribulation and during the tribulation, Israel finally realizes we cannot accomplish deliverance for the earth. She's been in birth pangs and birth pangs and birth pangs, but nothing tangible has ever resulted all the previous years. And you know, that's the rabbi's Isaiah 53 theology. The rabbis say that Israel is the suffering servant mentioned in Isaiah 53. Israel then brings salvation to the world. That's the current rabbinic Isaiah 53 theology. Israel is the suffering servant that brings salvation to the world. But we see, we'll see that in verses 17 and 18 that will finally be abandoned. You know, we have writhed in, in birth pangs and birth pangs and birth pangs and the only thing that's happened is we've given birth to wind. We could not bring deliverance to the world. That, that theology, the theology that rejects Yeshua as the Messiah will finally be abandoned at the end of the tribulation. And also at the end of the tribulation in preparation for the kingdom, there'll be the resurrection of the Old Testament saints in verse 19. 
Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy, for your dew is at the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Now this is one of the few Old Testament passages that clearly specifies a coming resurrection. Now there's a little bit of a uh, textual issue here, and I think that textual issue is handled best by the New King James Version. Let's take a look at what's going on here. In verse 19, the first phrase says, your dead shall live, and it's plural, talking of many dead people. The next phrase reads, my dead body, that's Isaiah speaking, in the singular. And the next phrase, they shall arise, again in the plural. So we've got a whole bunch of dead bodies that will arise, and how does how does Isaiah's singular dead body fit in with all that? Well, there's been various solutions proposed. I think the simplest one and the most accurate one is the New King James Version. The translators inserted the explanatory comment together with. So it reads very smoothly, your dead shall live, your many dead shall live, together with, Isaiah says, my dead body they shall arise, will all be resurrected together, is the point of verse 19. Isaiah is looking forward to that resurrection. And this, um, this resurrection is, is accompanied with a command to rejoice, awake and sing, those that dwell in the, in the dust, and their resurrection is compared to the dew, the dew of the morning, the dew of light is the literal Hebrew. The dew of the dawn, the dew we find thickly falling upon the foliage in the early morning hours. And dew is an extremely valued commodity in Israel because Israel is a water scarce area. And so the dew provides a lot of uh, moisture for the plants. So it's invigorating, it's looked forward to, it's, it's precious. And so I have decided to show a few pictures of heavy dew fall. Here's uh, heavy dew on a um, on a leaf on a uh, it looks like some grass, but that dew will provide water for that blade of grass. And here we have a beautiful picture of a dew drop on a leaf. And here's my favorite picture that I ran across. Here are these two ladybugs getting ready to get a drink out of a couple drops of dew. Dew is invigorating. Dew is important and desired in the land of Israel. And so this resurrection will be like dew the early morning dew on the grass. Now the resurrection of the Old Testament saints will take place after the tribulation because the rapture includes only New Testament saints, only the church. Now this is verse 19, is one method that God will use to increase the population of the nation of Israel. He will resurrect the Old Testament saints and they will come and live in the kingdom. So when the Old Testament saints are resurrection, are resurrected, excuse me, when the Old Testament saints are resurrected, then will come, pat, come to pass the statement, the earth shall cast forth the shades. The Old Testament saints who had a shadow-like existence in Sheol will take on flesh and blood again at the resurrection. Now the subject of the resurrection is found in only two other places in the Hebrew Scriptures. Daniel 12, 2, and Hosea 13, 14. There's only three passages, Isaiah 26, 19, Daniel 12, Isaiah 13, that deal specifically, that pinpoint a resurrection. And so the Sadducees and Pharisees had a big debate going on over this due to the scarcity of verses. But I think the verses are pretty straightforward. It doesn't have, you don't have to have a million verses to, to um, support your position. In God's holy word, word, it only takes one. But let's take a look at the other two. Daniel 12, 2. May those who sleep in the dust of the ground, many, excuse me, I'm sorry, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So notice there's two, two um, segments of people who will be resurrected. Many to everlasting life, others to disgrace and contempt. Then in Hosea 13, 14, uh, this is quoted, picked up by Rabbi Shaul and quoted in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? 
O death, where are your thorns? O Sheol, where is your sting? So the answer to those questions is, a rhetorical answer is yes. Rhetorical questions. Yes, God will ransom them from the power of death and Sheol. And so this is picked up by Rabbi Shaul in 1 Corinthians 15. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on the immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? It's gone. It's gone. So now we move in verses 20, and starting in verse 20, to the restoration of Israel. And we see, we see the process that it's going to go through. We begin with, by looking at Israel's refuge in the tribulation period. There will be a place of hiding for the nation. Verse 20, Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. So this is a quick flashback to the tribulation period. We're in the kingdom, quick flashback to the tribulation, then we'll jump back to the kingdom again. So Israel is commanded to hide until the indignation is passed. Now there are additional passages dealing with this subject, and these passages deal with the flight of Israel. So let's take a look at this uh, flight of Israel in a little more detail. In Revelation 12, 12 and 13, we read this. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, and that's the Jewish people in Israel. So there comes a time when Israel will be heavily, heavily persecuted. And Yeshua picks that time up in Matthew 24. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must do what? They must flee. Here's the Jewish flight. They must flee to the mountains. And then back to Revelation chapter 12, that flight of Israel is covered again. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God. So persecution comes. Yeshua says, my command to you when that persecution comes in the middle of the tribulation is to flee. Revelation 12, 6 picks up that scene again. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. So there's a refuge. There's a place, a hiding place. So that there she would be nourished 1,260 days. And that hiding place is described in Micah 2, 12. I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in a fold. Literally, it should say sheep in Basra. Like a flock in the midst of its pasture, they will be noisy with men. And so we can map this out uh, as we look at our campaign of Armageddon map. We can take a quick look at all this. We start with the first stage of the campaign of Armageddon, which is the Antichrist armies assembling at Armageddon, at Har Megiddo. So the Har Megiddo overlooks the Jezreel Valley. So all the nations of the world will send men and materiel to the Jezreel Valley to join the Antichrist army. Now at that time, Babylon will be the religious, political, and economic capital of the world, the Antichrist headquarters. This brings us to the second stage of the campaign of Armageddon. The Antichrist will join his troops. He will leave his capital and go to the Jezreel Valley, to Har Megiddo. This opens up the opportunity for the third stage of the campaign of Armageddon, the destruction of Babylon. We learn from a Jer Jeremiah 51, 27 and 28, that the kingdoms of Ararat, uh, located there, the kingdoms of Mini, located there, the kingdoms of Ashkenaz, located off the map, join forces together with the kingdom of the Medes, located there. And that army comes against Babylon in a surprise attack. And Babylon is totally violently and uh, quickly dispensed with, destroyed. Babylon has never been destroyed in that manner yet. So this all waits the future fulfillment. Babylon totally and absolutely destroyed. Well, the Antichrist does not defend his city. He's left it. He has other goals in mind. So this comes to, brings us to the fourth stage of the campaign of Armageddon, the fall of Jerusalem. He sends his army south against Jerusalem. A horrendous battle uh, begins. 
and uh, tremendous casualties, especially on the Antichrist side, but Jerusalem falls. And this brings us to the fifth stage, which is the Tribulation of Holocaust beginning and the Jewish flight to Basra. Here is the, here is the context for that flight to Basra, that flight to the place of refuge, the place of refuge in the desert and in the mountains. Those who survive the attack by Antichrist will flee to Basra in the land of Edom. And Basra is located in the Mount Seir mountain range. That's where the Edomites lived. Basra or Petra, there in the Mount Seir mountain range. And here's a picture of the Mount Seir mountain range. You can see it's a very rugged place of refuge. Very defendable, very rugged place of refuge. And the point is, the initial place of the second coming will be Basra or Petra, where the most important segment of Jewish people will be hiding out. That will be the initial point of the second coming of Yeshua. Alright, so that speaks about Israel going into hiding, running into hiding. Now in verse 21 we come to the purpose for the tribulation. This is the second purpose for the tribulation. For behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. So this is the second purpose for the tribulation, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their sin. So when the earth is sufficiently punished for her sin, God will turn to those hidden away, those hidden away in the refuge, and that will lead to the salvation, the national salvation of Israel. Well, that brings us to chapter 27 in verse 1, and we get a look at the punishment of Leviathan. Verse 1, In that day the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. And notice, in that day, in the day of Israel's restoration, Leviathan will be killed. Now, who or what is Leviathan? This reference to Leviathan has provoked a great deal of controversy among commentators. Some see parallels in ancient Near Eastern literature. In ancient Near Eastern literature, Leviathan is a symbolic, mythical creature. It's generally suggested that the symbolic, mythical creature of the ancient Near East is used as a figure of speech to describe the enemy nations. Assyria, Babylonia, and Egypt are three monsters, three Leviathans, whom the Lord will defeat. Well, I don't quite take that view. In view of the millennial context of this passage and the fact that Leviathan is also referred to as that crooked serpent, the dragon, I would agree with commentators that hold a different view. I would agree with commentators who conclude that the text indicates that Isaiah, by Isaiah, that God has victory over Satan in view here. Okay? God has his victory over Satan in view here. Revelation 20 verse 2. So rather than using the imagery of Leviathan as a symbol of the monstrous enemies of Israel, it seems more appropriate to me that the prophet would use this mythical symbol as to represent the monster of monsters, Satan himself. So here's the punishment of Leviathan in chart form. The Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce sword, the twisted serpent with his great sword, the dragon who lives in the sea with his mighty sword. So again, relating the structure of Isaiah to Revelation, after the return of the Lord, Satan is confined. The reference here in Isaiah is expanded in Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3. So after Israel's national regeneration, Satan is taken and punished he is confined to the abyss for a thousand years. So the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, the twisted serpent, the dragon who lives in the sea. And then in Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3, we see that punishment. Satan is confined to the abyss for a thousand years. That's the initial stage of his punishment. Of course, the final stage will be when he's cast into the lake of fire. And now we come in chapter 27 starting in verse 2, with the Song of the Vineyard. And I've only got about five minutes left. Well, let's get started in this. Let's see how far we can go. 
Now we did come across a previous song in chapter 5, the song of the vineyard in chapter 5. God planted it, but instead of good grapes, the vineyard in chapter 5 brought forth wild grapes. And God's response is to leave it unprotected. Let it succumb to briars and thorns. Withhold the rain from it. But now, now with Israel's natural regeneration in the kingdom, there's a new and different song of the vineyard. Verse 2, in that day, a vineyard of wine, sing of it. So there's our, the introduction to the song. The Lord is going to keep and water it in verse 3. I, the Lord, am its keeper. I water it every moment so that no one will damage it. I guard it night and day. So this is in contrast to chapter 5, where God refused to keep and water the, the vineyard. And then the Lord will declare war on the thorns and the briars unless they make peace with him. Verse 4 and 5. I have no wrath. Should someone give me briars and thorns in battle, then I would step on them and I would burn them completely. Or let him rely on my protection. Let him make peace with me. Let him make peace with me. So this again is in contrast with God's actions in chapter 5. The thorns and the briars are the enemies of Israel. Here he's going to treat them with mercy, but he's going to protect Israel rather than let them overrun Israel. And the result is that Israel will be fruitful in verse 6. In the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will fill the whole world with fruit. So again, in contrast to chapter 5, Israel will now be fruitful. Jacob will take root downward. Israel will blossom and bud upward. So the vine will be entirely healthy. The vine will be completely healthy from top to bottom, from root to fruit. We'll have a, an Israel blossoming and budding in the land and the earth being filled with the blessings of a fruit, the blessings of the Messianic kingdom. So here's a quick summary of the vineyard songs. We'll look at the feature and compare Isaiah 5 to Isaiah 27. The first feature is the produce. In Isaiah 5, it's wild grapes. In Isaiah 27, it's good grapes. In, in uh, the feature is God's response. In Isaiah 5, the vineyard was unprotected, the rain was withheld, the thorns and the briars were encouraged. But now, in chapter 27, the vineyard is protected, it's well watered, the thorns and the briars are opposed. Now, in, in regard to the result, in Isaiah 5, the vineyard was destroyed. In Isaiah 27, the vineyard fills the world with blessing, with fruit. In uh, regard to the time, Isaiah 5 speaks of Isaiah's day. Isaiah 27 speaks of the Messianic kingdom. So that's a summary of the, of the second song of the vineyard, uh, a, a joyful song regarding Israel's fruitfulness. However, the story is not over yet. However, a cleansing must come, a purging must come, a purging of Israel. And that will pick up in Isaiah chapter 27 verses 7 through 9. We're going to have to look back at the fact that Israel needs to be cleansed and purged. And so a devastation is going to come upon Israel. It won't be like the devastation coming upon other nations but it will be a judgment upon the land. All right, well, I'm down to about a minute, so let's call it quits. We won't start into this section on the purging of Israel till next session. So we'll pick it up next session. So glad you've been our students uh, during this session, and we hope to see you at our next session. Lehi throat, lehi throat.